This is a friendship class, Sunday School, Revelation Lesson 13, July 24, 2022. Father, thank you for being with us. Thank you for this very complicated letter and for your presence to help us understand them. We uh, play, pray that you be with us while we study and that you go with us as we leave. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to begin with Revelation chapter 4. We have already started this, and uh, uh, so we are taking it up in this uh, chapter. And we had come to the conclusion about elders. Remember around the throne scene, there was uh, God the Father sitting in his throne, and there were several other uh, entities present. Uh, there were uh, four living beings and 24 elders. Now, the elders are probably the most difficult and most controversial of all these entities, and so I am going to summarize very quickly what the conclusions were about the angels. And <clears throat> the final tip-off is given to us by Isaiah. Isaiah 24:23. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Now this brings us to the conclusion that the elders, uh, we're not sure why there are 24 exactly, but the elders in association with Jesus represent the supreme court and the good portion of uh, the angelic hosts or angels. Uh, there's also an evil version of this. Satan has angels, which we call demons. And... Uh, and so, let's leave it at that. The 24 elders, along with Jesus, uh, represent the supreme uh, beings. So, the elders represent, along with Jesus, the supreme council of the good group of spirit beings. And this brings us to the lamps. <laughs> there were seven lamps before the throne. And out from the throne came flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. We might say at this point that this represents the sevenfold aspects of the Holy Spirit, but we'll get on with it. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him in Isaiah chapter 11. The Spirit of Wisdom, uh, the Spirit of Wisdom is the one uh, the understanding, three, spirit of counsel, four, and strength, five, the spirit of knowledge, six, and the fear of the Lord, seven, the sevenfold spirit, the Holy Spirit, in other words. 
So let's move on then. That's the explanation. So we know that in the throne room, before the throne, are seven lamps, which represent the sevenfold aspects of the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to discuss the four living beings around the throne. Unfortunately, the King James Version of the Bible calls him beasts, B-E-A-S-T-S. -E and that is uh, uh, not a very good translation. The word is wrong. But we say, before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal, and the center and around the throne four living creatures. Now, that's the New American Standard uh, translation. The Greek is zoa, living beings, not therion. Uh, the, if, if these had been beasts, then they would have been called therion. But they were not. They are simply Zoa, living beings, full of eyes in front and behind, can see all around in every direction. The first creature, and I'll uh, jump the gun and call him a cherub, was like a lion. The second creature, like a calf. The third creature had a face like that of a man, and the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. So, what is the interpretation of that? Well, various interpreters have in, in, provided various interpretations. The first that I'm going to list is that the four faces represent four of God's most glorious beings. And uh, these are the result of creation. Second, some people say the four faces represent Jesus as king, that is the lion. Jesus is the man. A sacrifice, a calf or ox, and the bearer or rescuer, eagle. Now, there is not uh, <clears throat> there is not a clear cut reason for believing this is this is a little bit of an over spiritualization, I believe. Third is the four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But those who believe that uh, have no agreement about which one is which. And so I'm going to leave that one alone. And the fourth, the tribal camps around the tabernacle. Now, this is the depiction of the camp of the wilderness tabernacle when it was in camp. In the midst where the actual uh, tent was, uh, the tabernacle, uh, the, the people of Levi lived around there and they were the priests who served in the sanctuary of the tabernacle. To the right, that is on the east side, is Judah and, and the, the lion. Now you'll see there are four groupings. Each uh, of the groupings have three tribes, and each of the tribes had what was called a standard. That is, they displayed 
um, flags with some kind of emblem on them that represented that tribe. And there was a primary tribe in each of the four groups, and then two additional tribes were along with them. So Judah is on the east. Judah's uh, standard is a lion. And uh, the two tribes associated with him will be Issachar and Zebulun. Now, going around uh, clockwise, on the south is Reuben. And it's the, the standard of Reuben was a man. And the two tribes associated with Reuben are Simeon and Gad. Gad. And when you go on around to the west, the standard of Ephraim, the main tribe, uh, the standard is either a calf or an ox. And the other tribes associated are Manasseh and Benjamin. Now, on the north, the principal tribe was Dan. And uh, its standard has an eagle. Now, the explanation for that is in the characterization of his sons, Jacob in chapter 50 of uh, Genesis, described each of them. And Dan, he said, is a serpent in the grass that will bite the horse's hoofs. And the tribe of Dan objected very strongly to having a standard representing a serpent because of the evil meanings of serpents. And so they wanted to have on their standard the chief enemy of the serpent, the eagle. The eagle eats serpents. So some people say that this arrangement represents the depiction of the faces of the living beings. Now, to define them even further, we go to the book of Ezekiel. And in the first chapter of Ezekiel, chapter Ten, I mean, verse 10, it says, As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right, face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle on his rear. Now, there's further definition of this in chapter 10 of Ezekiel. In chapter 10, verse 14 says, And each one had four faces. He sees, uh, he sees a vision, and it's something like the, the God or the, uh, the ancient of days support supported by these creatures. And each one, in verse 14, each one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. We'll come back to that. The second face was the face of a man. The third face of a lion. Fourth, the face of an eagle. And in, in verse 15, and the cherubim, and he identifies these as cherubim. And cherub is the singular, and cherubim is plural in that language. Then the cherubim rose up. They are the living beings that I saw by the river Kebar early 
in the first chapter of his book. Now back to Revelation uh, 4, 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. I'm going to take you to Isaiah. One of This is one of the throne scenes, one of four throne scenes. <clears throat> and in Isaiah 6, it has to do uh, with the commissioning of Isaiah as a formal prophet. And it begins uh, in the year of King Isaiah, a good king. In the year of Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. Two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, Seraphim. A cherub, or cherub, is a form of angel, although they never, they do not really carry uh, messenger messages, and so they are loosely ter termed angels sometimes. When you see them in the presence of the Shekinah glory, the Shekinah glory glows and provides light. And so when you see them in the Shekinah glory or in association, association with it, they are called seraphim, the burning ones. And so it's, you know, I, know, I hope you know the similarity in this vision. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. From Ezekiel, this is an explanatory note. From Ezekiel, we understand the four living beings are cherubim. Remember, they are, cherubim is the plural. Who stay close to God and rush to carry out his wishes. When cherubim are in the Shekinah glory, they are burning and are called seraphim. Satan was created a cherub. Now, this, all of this should do away with uh, the uh, uh, romantic notion that a cherub is a, a little round-bottom baby with little wings and so on. The cherubim are nothing to deal with. They are the protectors and the implementers of God's will. And Satan was a cherub when he was created, but his pride caused him to fall into the evil side of the spirit beings. 410. The 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne, will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne. Say, and I've got a note here. Uh, you, if, if you're not careful, you think of this as a repeated action. That is, 
these elders are forever throwing their crown, their, their thrones before the person on the throne. That's a one-time event, and it's a definition, it's a description of the throne scene that occurs once in this section of the Revelation. Now, when, when they, they cast their crowns before the throne and they say, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Now, I paraphrase this last, paraphrase this little bit, and I will say they exist and were created because he wanted them to do so. Now, this is the end of the lesson, but I want to um, illustrate something using this image. There are actually two passages in the Bible that fit this. I want to give you a question. It's not a hard question. Don't try to make it hard. But the question is this. What was Adam doing? Where was he before he was created? Now the answer, just to not dawdle with it, the answer is he wasn't anywhere. He didn't exist before he was created. And therefore, he was not and could not have been doing anything to entice God to create him. All right. I'm going to call your attention to an old poem called God's Thrombones. And in that poem, not in Scripture, in that poem, in that poem, the assertion is that God was lonely. He never was lonely. But they say that's why he created Adam. All right. Second question. Next question, rather. When Adam and Eve having been created, died after their disobedience and sin in the Garden of Eden. When they did that, all their posterity died spiritually. Now, God had said, on the seventh day, he rested because he was through creating. He, uh, he intended not to create anymore. He had created all he wanted to. Now, however, after the sin and death, uh, the ones who came to Jesus, or who came primarily in faith and in trust, received eternal life. So, that indicates, as Scripture says, that they were creations, new creations. And God was forced to get back into the creation business, if you want to put it that way, because of the death 
of the people and anything he did to save them was a miracle. And the, so we can then ask, well, why does he do that? Why does he create these new creatures? Here's the answer. Because he wanted to, or because he wants to. Now that's the explanation. And running through that little exercise may help with your understanding of grace. The people were given spiritual life through grace, grace activated by faith, and that is how they came to be saints, Christians. Father, we thank you so much again that you're with us. Open our hearts and our minds and let us follow carefully as you propound this um, difficult but exciting book. And we ask that you go with us as we leave. For we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.